Hi, and welcome, John Medai. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, I'm glad to he uh, be here. Um, Miss Marik, is that pronounced correctly? Uh, it, it works, yeah, <laughs> I'm fine with that. Yeah, um, I found you um, because you know about distribution. You are the author of several books, uh, one being The Vocation of Business Towards a Truly Free Market. Mm -hmm. And um, no, <laughs> sorry. The Vocation of Business is, is a, one book, and the other one is Towards a Truly Free Market, and that I have here. And if I may be permitted to do some advertising, yes. I have another book coming out next week, um, a Theology, Logos or Mythos, which is a debate with a, um, an exchange of letters with a, a strict Thomist. And so it's kind of a debate between a sort of postmodern theology and a uh, scholastic theology. So that's coming out next week. Huh? Wow, yeah, I did, I did see that on your Facebook page and I was like, okay, next time I'm ordering books. I did, I did just order one from Rabbi Sachs. So I thought like, next time <laughs> I'll take that one as well. I had the honor of um, sitting next to him at lunch oh. when he, uh, he visited the University of Dallas. Uh, he was a very, very good man. I was very sad to see his passing. Yeah, and the, this book came out only this year. It was um, uh, about the common, the common good in yes. uh, divided times. So, and the common good is really what distributism is about. Yes. So distributism. I know many of my viewers have no idea what this is, and we're talking about economics today in some way. Yes. Let's educate our, us ourselves. You educate me and, and our viewers can also join in. I think it would be more accurate to say though that we're talking about political economy. Mm -hmm. And there's a very big difference. There's a, a kind of a sad difference when at the end of the 19th century, politics and economics got separated because you cannot have, um, a, well, every economic system is inscribed within a political system. So a system of property rights, a system of laws, a system of social expectations, etc., and cannot be understood except in reference to that political system. Whereas every political system is dependent upon its economic base. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, the system will progress um, more or less guided by its own economics. So I don't think there's a political science uh, and an economic science per se um, that exists or can exist. There's only political economy. And I think it's a tragedy that the, um, the economists know so little of politics and the political scientists know so little of economics. Mm -hmm. Just, they cannot, I do not believe they cannot be studied in isolation. Because I, I did study political science and I spent, uh, was it 10 weeks studying economics, I think, oh. all together. And the same amount of statistics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> that was cruel, but anyways, uh, because I but I found distributism. Uh, I, as I told you, I work for the Christian Democratic Party of Sweden, mm -hmm. and distributism also have the basis of subsidiarity, solidarity, and respect for the human person, which yeah. you find in Christian democracies. I thought perhaps they could be interlinked in some way. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Well, I think so because. Um um, distributism is by nature um, uh, Christian, uh, although it's it's not s specifically Christian, but Christian um, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it recognizes dependence upon the natural order, which is an expression of the divine order. Mm -hmm. and it um, um, it presumes the dignity of all, the equal dignity of all men. Um, so the, um, and it's, in that sense, it is uh, uh, Christian. It's a democratic 
though, in a surprising way. It's not just democratic politically, it's democratic economically, because what distributism primarily distributes is uh, property. Mm -hmm. And property is the basis of all economic relationships. So um, if property is gathered in a few hands, you'll have um, uh, one kind of political system. If it's uh, considered an arist aristocratic privilege or duty, you have another kind of system. And if it's spread out widely so that you know, the, um, the general mass of men have their own property, and I mean productive property, mm -hmm. and you have uh, still yet another political, political economic system. So um, uh, that's what distributism does. It distributes, um, it distributes property, and in doing so, it also distributes uh, political uh, power. Yeah. Because sooner or later, the state will always reflect the property system. And I, I did read up a bit and I found this that, uh, was it Chesterton that said that there were not too, uh, uh, too few, there were too few capitalists. Right. There should yeah. be more. <laughs> because well, exactly. capital should be spread yes. on more people. There's a, funny, there's a funny connection here between capitalism and communism. Mm -hmm. In communism, you know, members of the party are maybe 10 to 15 percent of the population. Well, in capitalism, the capitalists, the people who have meaningful control of um, the means of production, are maybe 10 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, both capitalism and communism um, fail at producing capitalists and communists. Yeah. But most people know uh, or would say that they understand the system like capitalism and socialism. But mm -hmm. would you agree with distributism to be a third way or is it separate? And in what way does it then uh, differ from the other two more known systems? Yeah, yeah. Uh, third ways, see I find the third ways tend to be some kind of compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, Capitalism is not a compromise with anything. Uh, so it is not in that sense a third way, but it definitely is a different system uh, than either capitalism or uh, communism. And I think it expresses though the highest goals of both. So um, the, um, <clears throat> um, with just, with, um, the funny thing, again, another connection between capitalism and communism is that both collectivize the economy. Mm -hmm. So in communism, production is gathered into state collectives, but in capitalism, it's gathered into corporate collectives. It is not private property. So you hear people talk a lot about private property and the sacred right of private property. And that's true, but it has nothing to do with capitalism mm. because um, most of our production and distribution chains are all in corporate collectives. And the only difference is that in, instead of having a bunch of um, bureaucrats, state bureaucrats who are in charge of this collective property, you have a bunch of private bureaucrats who are in charge of a collective property. It's not true private property. Now, I own lots and lots of stocks, okay? I, yeah. It's my retirement portfolio. But I, it's, it's incorrect to say that I own these companies as private property. I mean, if I own a private property, I can use that property any way I want. I can enter it any time I want. I have responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. If I own a share of stock, you know, they're not going to let me into IBM offices because I own a share of stock. No. I'm not the owner of IBM in any meaningful sense of that word. Uh, it's a collective and I have rights to um, any profits that the board of directors cares to distribute. And if they don't distribute it, I don't get it. Um, but, but why is ownership important? Ah, uh, because ownership is freedom. Mm. Okay, so, and that's the problem with the free market is that it generally isn't very free. 
So if a person, say if a mechanic has his own tools, mm. and can make a living with his own tools, then if I'm going to offer him a job, I have to offer him something better than what he has. And so under those conditions, he is free to refuse my offer. Mm. Maybe he just doesn't, maybe it's not good enough. Maybe he can make as much on his own, or maybe he, uh, um, he just doesn't like working for me. He's free to say yes or no. Mm. But in a normal, you know, in a normal capitalist economy, really the worker isn't free to say no. He has to say yes to somebody, you know, and usually there's only a few places where jobs are on offer. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's not really true to say that he has the f freedom uh, to work or not to work. Mm. Um, whereas with the example of my mechanic with his own tools, well, he can just go door to door and fix cars. <laughs> if that's <laughs> To do, uh, he is free to say no to um, uh, any job offer because he mm. can do it by himself. And without being able to say no to an offer, you really don't have a free market. Mm. Um, so, in granting property, you grant independence to people. You grant them the also the option of gathering together not in collectives, but in cooperatives. Mm -hmm. So if you look at something like the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation of Spain, or the co-ops in um, uh, Northern Italy, uh, places like that, you'll find yet a different conception of property, cooperative property, which is, uh, again, another aspect of distributism. Which I understand as a sort of a local market, uh, to be uh, where you you sell and buy within this area and mm -hmm. or is that is that so or would you understand? well the local markets i think are the more important markets although say mm -hmm. something like mondragon is international it does uh, mm -hmm. it competes in the global market um, along with everybody else but that gets another subject into globalism <laughs> and what yeah. the proper proper use of globalism is um, the um, but any trades that does that don't build up the local markets, mm. uh, I think, are dubious, suspicious mm. at best. Uh, yeah, I read somewhere also that you could. Um, this was another distributist talking. You said that uh, you have a moral choice where you spend your money, and you should spend it locally. To build up the local society. Exactly, yes. Right now, um, communities are just appendages of the global market. Mm. So if they decide to relocate, then the community dries up because it had nothing, you know, it became so dependent upon that global market that it had no resources of its own. So this has happened to vast swaths of the United States. Mm. So the interior has become depopulated. Um, but in like like we had we have this one place in Sweden where mm -hmm. they uh, built a huge can't call it bakery but a factory that produces bread, mm -hmm. and basically everyone worked there except for the ones working like in schools and such. Mm -hmm. But they, they work for tax money, so they're not producing in that way. So everyone's working there and they, they invested millions and millions of Swedish kronas. And the day it was going to, to open its new line, it burned down. The whole thing burned down it's just a few weeks ago. So everyone's out of business. <laughs> no one has a job. And they are going to, to rebuild and they want to reopen. But what would the choice have been for like a distributive? Uh, kind of working place would everyone has had have had their own uh, bakeries at home and then sold it what? well uh, you know a series of small bakeries one leads to leads to mm -hmm. choice okay the huge mm -hmm. bakery uh, the factory mm -hmm. um, the bread factory is probably I think you're right it's probably better to call it a bread factory than a bakery yeah. uh, the uh, it produces whatever it produces okay but um 
it doesn't really compete with itself. So, um, but whereas if you have a dozen bakeries in town, mm. well, they say, well, you know, uh, Maria's bakery is good, but um, uh, Jan's is, is terrible. I wouldn't go there. You know, that's that's how that's how that works. Yeah. Um, and so you get this tremendous variety, this tr tremendous competitive variety, um, which you really don't get uh, from industrialized production. It, uh, the whole logic of industrialized production is standardization. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, even though they may produce um, varieties of products, the really is the, um, um, there's really not much real variety there. It's, mm. it's uh, um, this market segmentation, but it's not real variety in the same way that different bakers would produce their own kinds of bread. Mm. But you also talk about moral and justice in economics. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Well, yes. economics is a moral science, that it's a science of of those human relationships that are necessary for the material provisioning of society. Now, human relations are always governed by the virtue of justice. Mm. Now, justice has three parts, uh, commutative, distributive, and legal. So it starts with distributive justice, and that's the distribution of rewards from a group to the members of the group. So things like wages and um, dividends, those all come under distributive justice. Um, and without distributive justice, nothing really works. Mm. Even normal supply and demand curves cannot work without distributive justice. Um, commutative justice just is about how individuals exchange among themselves, okay? And that, um, um, that is dependent upon getting what you pay for. Basically, you have, before an exchange, you have the same amount. So you have a dollar mm -hmm. and somebody has a loaf of bread worth a dollar, you exchange, and both sides have exactly what they had numerically mm -hmm. before and after the trade. That's commutative justice. And then legal justice is what the individual say the voter or the, the citizen, the worker, what they owe to the group. Mm. And what they owe is whatever is necessary for good order. Okay, so all three of these together add up to the common good. Yeah. But let's go back a little bit because I started asking you and I'm not sure that everyone will follow. Um, you have uh, say communism, socialism, uh, that kind of economic system that works in that. And then you have uh, what some people call free market, but you say it's not free, it's capitalism. And, and there you have like 10% uh, <laughs> holding the power and here you have 10% holding the power. And how is power more even spread in a distributive Society. Well, I think when you spread property, you spread power. Mm -hmm. Because property will, I mean, power will sooner or later devolve onto uh, uh, property. I could devolve onto other things, military might, um, yeah. but that will always end up seizing the property. Um, it could uh, rely on religious authority, but as we saw in the Middle Ages, the, the church ended up with one third of the property um, mm -hmm. in its hands. So sooner or later, all um, power comes down to control over property. And control of property is control of people's lives. Yeah. If you own all the property, <laughs> you will end up with the political uh, uh, power yeah. uh, and the economic power. So when you distribute these things, only then, only in those circumstances, I would argue, can you really have democracy that a political democracy really rests on an economic democracy. Mm. And it's, um, it's very difficult to have the one without the other. 
but that also boils down to the the subsidiarity in in politics because they are connected and to to i read this also but to have the politicians as close as you can kick them um mm -hmm. i wouldn't want that because i am a local politician <laughs> <laughs> but i understand the concept <laughs> Always that they could do, not that they would, but that yes. they could. That's the important thing. Huh? The um, uh, yes, well, I, I used to be a local politician. As a matter of fact, I used to be um, uh, uh, the mayor pro tem of uh, our city here. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, local politicians do have a connection with the people. That uh, uh, I mean. Joe, Joe Biden cannot be connected with 300 million people. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so everything gets mediated through more and more and more layers. Uh, and so politics becomes very, very remote. Um, it becomes more like a game, a spectator sport. Yeah, uh, it does. And it's presented in terms of a sport. It's, uh, the elections are presented as if they were a football game, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, each side scoring points and making plays. It's, it's, a, it's a form of entertainment rather than a form of governance. Mm, yeah, I agree with that. And also when you only have, uh, like in America, you only have two real choices for at least the, the, the presidential seat. Uh, then it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to see, like, where do you stand and where do you want which one do you want? And even though we have like uh, eight parties here, um, mm. it is it is um, a competition for power. Mm -hmm. But I strongly believe that once the competition is over, once the election is over, then you have to try to cooperate, even mm -hmm. with the ones you don't agree with. Right. And I think multi-party systems have an advantage in that mm -hmm. multi-party systems tend to broker ideas, mm -hmm. whereas two-party systems tend to broker power. Yeah. And in fact, the ideas aren't very important. In, uh, the, in this country, the Democratic and Republican parties have switched places. Mm -hmm. So when I grew up, the Democratic Party was the party of of uh, segregation of white power okay mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now that's totally switched places um and the republicans who after all produced abraham lincoln um uh the um began with abraham lincoln uh became the party of the old southern segregationists mm -hmm. uh so because the, it's not really related to ideas, it's related to power. Mm. So when the Republicans began losing the middle class, they made up for it by appealing to the, the Southern segregationists, okay? Yeah. Because yeah. that's about power, not about ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but it is about appealing to people that will give you the vote so that you then can do something. But we were talking about local politicians and I believe that it's possible to be a local politician and still have this distance to people. I've been working a lot with having open meetings and uh, the possibility to, to take part of politics, even if you choose not to be a party member. Um, because I think it's important to have this kind of connection. Um, and I was, th I was thinking, like, how is it possible to move from, because now we're in a capitalist system, very much so. How is it possible to move away from capitalism towards distribution? Who, who and how? <laughs> yes, well, there's good, there's good uh, models for that. And we were moving that direction in the United States. And you moved uh, a long way in that direction um, in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and the way it was done was um, by redistributing property basically through high taxes. Yeah. So you had taxes. So if you look at the uh, either Europe or the United States at the beginning of the 20th century, you had maybe the ten, the top 10 percent owned 90 percent of the property. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and they had very, very low taxes on that property. Uh, but that, and the, the biggest influence on breaking that down was, of course, there was a lot of worker pressure and there was a lot of um, um, inequalities uh, created that uh, created a, a tremendous political force. But the biggest source of change was the two world wars. Mm. You simply could not finance modern warfare on the old tax system. Uh, so more and more, in order to fight these wars, they had to get the money and to get the had to get get it from the people who had the money, which was the top ten percent. And so you had this tremendous rise of taxes on the top ten percent, which resulted in a more even distribution of property. Mm. Um, and that worked very well. That worked very well. So here in the United States, after Roosevelt, we had the New Deal, and the um, the share of income that went from the top ten percent um, dropped from about oh sixty or seventy percent to down to like thirty percent, mm. and so you had a much more egalitarian society. But then with Ronald Reagan and the neoliberals. Um, the um, those taxes were reduced and reduced and reduced, and you had the same rise uh, in ownership being mm. concentrated at the top that you saw at the beginning of the 20th century. So at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 20th century, you had almost the same situations, and in both cases, it is highly unstable. Mm. Yeah, I saw in your book this uh, where it was going up and down in the economics uh, with regression and such. Um, if you do not do political decisions on how to run economics so much. Yes, um, it turns out capitalism is highly unstable. Mm -hmm. Capitalism was stabilized by socialism. Mm -hmm. um, the um, If you look at the pre- um, socialist period, the average business cycle was about, I mean, top to bottom, boom to bust, mm. uh, about uh, 3.8 years. Okay, <laughs> so that's a very, yeah. very short business cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, but that, after the war, that cycle became longer and longer and longer, and up till 2000, between the war and like 2000, that the business cycle was six years. Mm -hmm. And in the 20th and the 21st century, it's been um, much, much longer. Matter of fact, okay, we haven't had a recession really since 2008, uh, which is an amazing, there's, uh, there hasn't been a long, that long a time in the, um, uh, from the 17th century to the 20th century, there was never that long a period without a recession. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't then people say that that's due to to capitalism? Like, thanks to capitalism, we did not have this, or what? Well, clearly that can't be the case no. because uh, it um, it's very definitely the intervention of um, government mm. that has um, uh, right now all governments are effectively Keynesian, uh, and it doesn't matter whether they're right, left, center. It doesn't matter. They mm -hmm. all believe that the government has to intervene, okay, um, either with monetary policy or fiscal policy mm -hmm. um, to balance the economy. And under capitalism, I think that's the only way. Um, every, every successful capitalist regime is Keynesian. Mm -hmm. and the government um, becomes the consumer of last resort. <laughs> government spending, uh, the economy would collapse. Mm. Uh, but I was thinking when you said like high taxes on the ones that have the most, and I know like my party in Sweden, they would be like, oh, but we want low taxes. Taxes should be as low as possible <laughs> as it could be and still keep some order. And isn't this socialism? That would be a lot of my viewers asking. Isn't it if you redistribute yeah. 
what's the difference? Oh, yes, it would be the socialization of property. That's mm -hmm. very, that's correct. Um, but I think the problem is you cannot look at socialism and capitalism as alternatives, mm -hmm. as contraries. They're complements. All markets, all markets depend on a pool of socialized goods. Yeah. That is to say, it doesn't matter how good you are at making something. If there are no roads to take it to market, mm -hmm. you won't be successful. If every entrepreneur had to uh, uh, drill his own well, dig his own latrine, uh, educate his own customers and uh, employees, um, ensure the safety of his own food supply, or use the hundred other services that are socialized, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have any time for his business. Okay, so all markets depend on socialized goods. Socialized goods, on the other hand, depend on vibrant markets. So the two are complementary, they're not contradictory. Mm. So the political question is determining which services should be socialized and which should be market uh, goods. Yes. So the big debate in the United States right now is over health care. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a hybrid system that turns out to be the most expensive and least effective system in the world. Um, I think we spend twice as much as you do as health, on health care. Uh, we don't have results that are nearly as good. Mm. Um, so should health care be a common good or a market good? That yeah. is where the debate is, I think. Yeah, I was reading another book that touches on this subject, but they were saying that we're no longer, we don't have a market economy, we have a market society where yeah. everything is up for grabs, so even. Health care and such. That's a good phrase. I think that's, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's very, uh, uh, tr tr problem is society cannot be based on the market. Mm -hmm. Market can only be based on society. Yeah. Um, now, Carl Polanyi, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but you should be. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he, he would argue that uh, in previous times, I mean, in, through all of human history, the market was something that supported society. Mm -hmm. okay. Until the modern era, when society was there to support the market. And this changed relationship has distorted everything. Yeah. Uh, so society exists within the market rather than the other way around. And that's just, when you think about it, that's just bizarre. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is. I think that we have evoked an interest for distributism at least with our half an hour now <laughs> together. Um, did we miss out on anything that you think we should have mentioned before? Well, I, th I think if you always need to uh, enter um, uh, free, the two elements I think are freedom and community. Mm -hmm. um, this is based, uh, freedom is based on, you know, people actually being not merely politically free, but economically free. Yeah. And the more free the citizens are economically, the more free they can be politically. And it also adds to community. And community is the most important thing. Community is how we live, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, without, uh, all life is in a sense communal life, family life, um, the local community, and then even maybe a national and international community. But you really can't have community with slaves. Mm whether they are chattel slaves or wage slaves, it doesn't matter. Um, they cannot build up community. So um, being economically free and uh, leads to being politically free, which leads, I think, to more community uh, and having communities that are more and more able to handle their own affairs without too much help from higher and higher mm. levels. So that's uh, solidarity and subsidiarity go together. They're all based on this freedom, which has to be an economic as well as a political freedom. Mm. Thank you so much, John.
for talking my with me today. Pleasure. It was my yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.